My name is Rula Halaf. I'm the editor of the Financial Times. And our session today is about defending Europe's united front. Uh, as you know, European nations have been uh, remarkably united over Ukraine. Uh, most countries have been steadfast in their support. I looked up the Eurobarometer for the autumn of 2023, and the polling shows that the public support for helping Ukraine is also holding up. 72% agree with providing financial support to Ukraine, 61% support the EU granting candidate status to uh, Ukraine. Uh, but, and there is a little but here, as we know from recent coverage in the FT, uh, the EU aid package to Ukraine has been held up, and while European states have made strides in increasing and, pool and pooling resources um, for collective defense, they haven't hit their own target uh, for the production of artillery rounds. Now, I'm delighted to explore uh, these questions and others uh, with a wonderful panel. Uh, Andrzej Dudas, President of Poland, thank you for being with us. Um, Mitro Kuleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Ukraine, thank you for being here. Katalin Novak uh, is the President of Hungary, great to have you. And uh, we will later be joined by uh, Andrzej Plenkovic, I'm hoping, the Prime Minister of Croatia, but until then, Svistiana Tsikanuskaya is the leader of the Democratic Forces of Belarus. Welcome. President Duda, I'm going to start with you. Would you say Poland was certainly one of um, the strongest supporters of Ukraine, uh, especially in the first year uh, following the invasion? But more recently, I've heard some comments from you describing Ukraine as a drowning person. Is that, uh, did I get it wrong, or is that really what you said? And what did you mean by that? Oh, mm, dear audience, if you could take your electronic First of all, I have to answer this question in the following way. The fact that we stood, we have stood with Ukraine since the very first moments of the invasion, but not only, please remember that just a few hours before the invasion, together with the Lithuanian president, Mr. Lito Gitanas Nalseda, we went to Kiev precisely in order to support in this symbolic way, being fully aware of the fact that probably just in a few moments Ukraine would be attacked by Russia. The information was reaching us by different channels, but a few hours before that happened, myself and President Gitanas Nalseda went to Kiev and we talked to President Volodymyr Zelensky, supporting him politically, morally, demonstrating also at the same time to the people of Ukraine, because that was extremely important to us, that they were not alone in that difficult situation. And indeed, I felt huge responsibility to act in that way as president of Poland, as president of the neighbor of Ukraine, that is number one, but number two, also a state which, as a matter of fact, speaking about historical relationship with Russia, has got a very similar past to us. Our history in this respect is the same, we can say. Both our countries, for hundreds of years, both our nations uh, were oppressed by Russia. And we in Poland know perfectly well, looking from the historical perspective, what Russian aggression means, what Russian occupation means, and what Russian enslavement means, what it means to be deported to Siberia, and what it means uh, Russian terror, what Russian terror stands for. So in that respect, Polish people 
that it's not only about Polish authorities, but Polish people do understand the situation of their neighbors from Ukraine perfectly well. That is why exactly right after the outbreak of the war, uh, people in Poland opened up their houses uh, en masse to refugees from Ukraine. They went to the border and they took people from the border to their private cars, people whom they have never seen before, to give them help. They were also putting their houses, their apartments at the disposal of the refugees. They shared whatever they had precisely because they understood what it meant that somebody was fleeing Russian invasion, because they understood what it meant that somebody wanted to take a shelter. And for the very same reason, let us remember that back then we heard that perhaps Ukraine would fall within three days, maybe within seven days, Russians would occupy Kiev. And then after a couple of days, it turned out not to be true. A heroic attitude of President Zelensky and his colleagues, his team, as well as uh, the heroism of the defenders of Ukraine stopped that one would imagine unstoppable march of the Russians. And I think that was quite obvious. Ukrainians started to ask for support. They started to ask for help. And that is why in Poland, among the top authorities of our country, actually right after the war started, we decided to donate to Ukraine more than 100 tanks from the um, warehouses of our armed forces. The tanks which uh, could be operated right away by Ukrainian soldiers because we had those tanks in our warehouses, uh, the post-Soviet era tanks, and that help was donated to Ukraine right away. And that indeed was the first significant military support that we provided Ukraine with. And in a sense, I'm proud to say that this opened up or started the whole wave of military assistance that reached Ukraine after that. As a matter of fact, um, over the period of almost two years, we have donated more than 300 tanks uh, from Poland, uh, including several Leopard uh, tanks, uh, state-of-the-art tanks that we had at the time. We were also the country which that was the thing that was said back then. We headed that so-called tank coalition. So we spearheaded the idea of donating state-of-the-art tanks to Ukraine. Um, all the time we have tried, and we are trying to support Ukraine, but we also keep calling upon the international community. And I believe it is my fundamentally important task. We are calling not to stop this help and aid to Ukraine, because it is quite simple. If we consider the potential that Russia has, both in terms of the economy as well as the population. If we look at the differences in the number of inhabitants living in Russia and in Ukraine, and also if we consider the potential, the size of the armies of Russia and Ukraine, it is obvious that Russia is crushing Ukraine with all those indicators. And the fact that the Ukrainians are able and have been able for two years now to stop uh, consecutive waves of Russian offensives, the fact that they are able to repel the attacks, and they are even able to uh, regain at least part of the territories occupied by the Russians. This demonstrates, on the one hand, an incredible determination and heroism of the defenders of Ukraine, and an absolutely incredible will to survive. Um, not only as a nation, but also as a nation with an own sovereign and independent state where they are going to decide about themselves. And the second thing, the second point, and the second thing, it also demonstrates that this international support um, has allowed Ukraine to survive all the time because, indeed, uh, there has been a lot of international support provided, but it is needed all the time. And the war fatigue, something that we have been talking about all the time, is a very dangerous, very risky phenomenon. And we have to try and prevent it. War fatigue. Yes, I think so. I think one can say that. Perhaps it is not very much politically correct. Maybe some people um, have got concerns or are afraid to say it out loud that this is the case. This war fatigue is visible. I will give you a very simple example. Ladies and gentlemen, just look at the information programs, at news uh, in your countries. Um, where can you see information about Ukraine? Uh, so if you look at the news programs in your country, where can you hear about aggression against Ukraine? In most cases, this information is not provided whatsoever. It is not in 
I, one of the things that um, I have been, um, I found really remarkable is that stories about Ukraine in the FT are still the top read stories. I see no fatigue whatsoever amongst our readers. But let me, but let me turn to, um, to Minister Kuleba, because you wrote in Foreign Affairs recently that there, was a growing defeat, <coughs> there were growing defeatist voices on Ukraine. Um, and yet your own, your own armed forces commander has described the war as a stalemate. Well, he uh, shared a message that was uh, largely overlooked in the same in the same piece. Everyone focused. It's just a matter of focus, you know. So everyone focused on the word stalemate. But what he also said, and that was the main point of his of his piece, is that uh, Ukraine needs uh, more weapons and more sustainable deliverables of uh, weapons in sufficient quantities to move on with the liberation of its territory and eventually winning the war. So it's really, you know, how you look at the issue. Whether if you if you believe that the glass is half empty, you focus on the word stalemate. If you believe that the um, uh, the glass is half full, you focus on providing Ukraine with more military assistance in order to make our forces capable of pushing Russia back. And we proved that we can do that. In 2022, we liberated a, a large part of our territory, 50% of the territory that had been previously occupied by Russia. In 2023, we pushed <laughs> Russian Black Sea fleet back uh, away from, uh, from our territorial waters, and uh, that allowed us to restore the uh, grain corridor that does not depend on Russia, that can function independently. And uh, 2024, of course, the priority is to throw Russia uh, from the skies because the one who controls the skies will define when and how the war will end. And that will require providing Ukraine with planes, which are underway, F-16s are underway, long-range missiles, uh, drones, and uh, Ukraine uh, significantly ramped up production of drones, and of course, electronic warfare. So if, that, if all of that comes, we will continue winning, and we will continue liberating. But you know, we are fighting a very big enemy a powerful enemy, an enemy that doesn't sleep, so it takes time. Do you agree with President Duda that there is war fatigue? And do you think that Europe and the U.S. are in this for the long term? Uh, I haven't heard uh, any official, neither in a meeting nor in a private conversation, who would say, listen, we are tired of helping you. So when we mention these words, war fatigue, we should we should clearly kind of define this term. And if you ask me, are we tired? Yes, we are tired. Of course you are. We've been fighting for two years. Uh, are we giving up? No, we are not. It doesn't matter how tired or exhausted we will be. We will keep defending our country. So it's absolutely normal for a human being to, and for a country, uh, to, to get tired, but uh, it would be abnormal to stop defending yourself but or you, helping us. Do you us. feel under pressure to start talking about peace? I know that you have a No, we don't. I can save some time. No, we don't. Okay, well, that's good. Okay. We can, we can move on. Uh, <laughs> President Novak, um, Hungary is one of the 27 EU member states, uh, but we often find ourselves uh, wondering what uh, Hungary's position is. I know that you um, have been, uh, you have met with uh, President Zelensky, but uh, what your prime minister says and, and does is concerning, I think, to Ukraine and to a lot of other European states. So do you agree with um, Viktor Orban's veto on using the EU budget to help Ukraine? Can I also use my mother tongue? Or, or, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I will. I will answer in uh, English, of course. No, no. I will. I will speak English. No, no. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, and uh, and first of all, it's my first time in Davos, so I'm still well, welcome uh, to Davos. Well, getting used to the traffic in the first place. And uh, uh, for example, last night I couldn't even make it to the dinner, and this time I can assure you that. Uh, Swiss trains are in time. So it's, I, I actually took the train to get here. So first, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for, for speaking about uh, this topic because uh, I think that uh, 
even if uh, we sometimes experience just referring back uh, to what President Duda uh, said and uh, Minister Kulaba, uh, if uh, we speak about the potential of war fatigue, then I think the way we can do something against it is that we keep on speaking about this uh, very and maybe most important topic uh, for now in, uh, uh, in, in our uh, neighborhood. And uh, I also have to, to position us uh, because uh, uh, we geographically are also in a, a quite specific situation given the fact that we are direct neighbors uh, to Ukraine. And not only that we are uh, direct neighbors, but we also have uh, Hungarian nationals uh, living on the territory of Ukraine. So I can also say that we are not only indirectly, but also directly hit uh, by the Russian aggression and uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, this uh, conversation today also gives us uh, the chance uh, to concentrate on what we agree on. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, the most important elements uh, are, are not even questionable. Uh, that uh, for the first moment on, I can even refer to uh, my uh, inauguration speech uh, two years ago, when I already there made it very clear uh, that I condemn uh, the Russian aggression, and uh, we have to make it clear uh, all the time who is the aggressor and uh, who is uh, uh, the, the country which uh, was uh, in, invaded uh, by another state. And we should also make it clear that uh, Russia has crossed the Rubicon uh, by this act. And uh, we should also make it clear, and I think that, what, uh, that is what uh, we have been doing in the uh, last uh, almost two years, we should make it clear that this is a no-go zone, so that uh, something like that uh, cannot happen. And if we want to try to preserve our uh, post-Second uh, World War uh, desire for peace, uh, uh, then we, we, we ha also have to clarify that war is never the solution and aggression is never the solution. And we tend to forget that uh, uh, Andrei Plankovic is also here uh, representing Croatia, so it's, it doesn't mean that uh, since the Second World War we haven't experienced any war on the territory of Europe. Actually, we did, in fact, in our southern neighborhood as well. For 10 years it lasted. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, this war uh, uh, is, is still ongoing after uh, two years uh, of uh, Russian aggression, and, uh, and still we don't uh, see the, the end. Uh, and, uh, do, you, do you think that... Do you believe that Ukraine can win? I think uh, Russia cannot win, and that is the most important, and that we have, we have to, to reach that, that uh, Russia cannot so, win. So for Russia, for Russia not to win, do you think that the EU package should actually go ahead? Uh, what, what I because think Ukraine that needs it. Yeah, I think that, uh, that we, we further have to support uh, Ukraine for sure, and I can assure you that uh, uh, Hungary will further be supporting Ukraine. Okay, that, that's a positive message. Are you, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I firmly believe that uh, Ukraine's membership in the EU, Ukraine's existence as a friendly democracy is in the best interest of Hungary and whole Europe. And uh, uh, we, Hungary is a very close partner. Uh, um, we do talk. Sometimes we have different positions, but we, in the end, we sit down but most, and discuss them. But most importantly, whatever the kind of, kind of uh, discussion, uh, discussions uh, we have, there is always a solution in the end. And uh, the last European Council, when the decision on opening accession talks was, uh, was made, just proved it once again. And I will be seeing Hungarian Foreign Minister recently, Madam President, has been visiting Ukraine. Um, President Zelensky spoke with Prime Minister Orban in Argentina in the end of the year. So we are absolutely focused on, fi on finding solutions, and I'm sure that we will find them. Uh, pr uh, Prime Minister Plenkovic, what's your assessment of European <coughs> unity, and to what extent do you think it will hold for the long haul? Because this, this war, as, as we know, is, um, is likely to last. First of all, my apologies for being late. I came <laughs> yesterday, even on time for dinner, but today it took us half an hour. Seventh year in Davos. Train. First time I am late. suggesting you. <laughs> but uh, my apologies. But a few points. First of all, um, big greetings to all the uh, colleagues who are here and friends. As someone who knows Ukraine uh, very well, who has been uh, working with Ukraine on Ukraine for many years, I firmly believe that we should be persistent in assisting Ukraine in such dire situation facing. Russian aggression now for two years. My analysis is that first year <clears throat> from the Russian posture was seen as um, issue of denazification of Ukraine, issue of questioning the identity of Ukrainians. Then as the war involved, 
it was uh, from Russian posture a concept are we fighting a proxy of NATO and now what we see recently is actually the debate or the posture evolving into the new concept of the new world order with an entirely changed balance of power globally <laughs> and in that context I think we should see what are our choices I said immediately in spring 2022 at one of our European Council debates in Ukraine that we need three elements that Ukraine wins. One, the motivation, heroism, sacrifice of Ukrainian soldiers, people, and motivating leadership, fighting for their existence and freedom. Second, is continued assistance by the West, both in terms of military assistance and in terms of financial assistance. Otherwise, it's very difficult for Ukraine to be left alone. And third, to make sure that we in the West resist the internal pressures happening within our own societies due to the consequences on our economy, on our energy situation, our social situation, on inflation, as one of the ramifications of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. So far, I think we have managed. That's why this debate on the revision of the multiannual financial framework, I think we should see it very technically. What are we basically doing as the European Union? We are just at the moment where we would have been anyway been debating about the revision of the current MFF, putting into a formal structure what we have been doing anyway for two years. And that is on a monthly basis, transferring funds to Ukraine. Now we want to do it systematically, 50 billion, 17, 33, in order to have some sort of perspective. Whether we shall do it within or without the classical budgetary framework, I think it's a secondary issue. The issue is that we help. This is essential. And I think that is actually what is going to happen. It would be very good politically if we could do it in the framework of 27 altogether. But if we don't, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll find a legal and a technical way to do it and ensure this consistency of assistance to Ukraine. Um, Svetlana, Belarus is in some ways a, another front in, um, in this war and in the EU's response to, to Russia. Do you, how do you rate European un unity and do you think that the opposition has benefited from the greater Western recognition of, of Russian aggression? Uh, first of all, I want to remind how the fate of Belarus and Ukraine are intertwined. Uh, we in Belarus fully understand that without free Ukraine, there will be no free Belarus. But also, without free independent and European Belarus, there will be constant threat to Ukraine, to our neighbors. Until Lukashenko's regime is in the country, you know, he will be puppet of Russia. He, Belarus will be balcony uh, to threat our neighbors. So that's why a victory of Ukraine is uh, of extreme importance for uh, Belarus as well. And that's why we are asking to give uh, Ukraine anything they ask, anything. And, uh, you know, when you ask about fatigue, you know, maybe so I'm so deeply involved, you know, in the situation in our region, you know, I have to protect Belarus. Uh, I have to fight together with the Belarusians against uh, Lukashenko's regime and the uh, Russian subjugation. Uh, I think that we don't have right to feel fatigue. Because when I feel about the words of fatigue, I think, look, tell these words to uh, Ukrainian soldiers in, in the trenches or Belarusian political prisoners who now are being tortured in prisons. They are continuing to resist, so we uh, should continue you know, to, to work together with them uh, as well. But, uh, of course, I um, understand that uh, Belarus is the weakest point, weakest link, uh, in Putin's war. Now, while Lukashenko is there, you know, Putin is using our country as a uh, playground, as, as uh, uh, they use using our infrastructure to uh, keep threat, uh, threatening Ukraine. But uh, when we get rid of Lukashenko's regime, when democratic um, government will be installed in Belarus, there will be uh, the best, uh, you know, the best way out, you know, for Belarusians, the, the uh, best help for Ukraine. You know, so uh, that's why we have to keep coalition uh, of countries who are supporting Ukraine and have to develop um, 
comprehensive strategy on Belarus. We need uh, pressure on the regime, uh, support to people, um, accountability for Lukashenko's crimes, and also commitment to future. And I want here to underline sometimes, uh, you know, indecisiveness of uh, democratic world. You know, Lukashenko committed many, many crimes. Crimes against humanity. He hijacked airplane. He uh, orchestrated migration crisis. He's kidnapping uh, Ukrainian children uh, from occupied territories to Belarus. And uh, uh, we need special investigation for the crimes. Why international structures are, uh, are working not so effective how the, than they could uh, do? So we... I, I believe that with consistency and decisiveness, we can get Belarus out uh, of the war uh, with help uh, of uh, Belarusian democratic forces. And thank you uh, to our, our uh, strategic partners, you know, in supporting us. Do you think he's been strengthened by the by the war because he's now part of a, uh, the Russian front? Uh, Lukashenko now is very fragile. Maybe it seems differently, you know, from abroad, but he feels fragile. He haven't managed to persuade Belarusian people in his legitimacy. He's uh, illegitimate in the eyes of Belarusian people. He's puppet of uh, Russia. He can't solve, uh, he can't decide anything by his own, you know, in, in uh, Belarus. But he needs uh, political support of Russia and he will fulfill all the orders uh, of Russia. And our task is to make uh, Lukashenko toxic to his own environment and to weaken him through uh, sanctions and through accountability. I want to switch to another topic that is very important to um, European uh, unity, and that is what happens in the US um, elections. Um, I know everyone, you've probably all had conversations already about anxiety in Europe uh, over the possible election of of Donald Trump. Uh, President Duda, um, are you worried that a Trump election will reopen divergent views in Europe, which is what we saw last time around? First of all, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I always repeat, it is the American people who decide who they will elect as their president. Just like all our societies, all our nations make their own decisions about who will be their president. If there is general presidential election in our country, uh, things differ. Sometimes there is a general presidential election, sometimes not. But if it is a general election for president, then it is the nation who decides, it is the people who decide who their president will be. And any kind of uh, um, intervention from outside, I think it shouldn't take place. So saying what will be better for the United States or speculating who's going to be the president, what's going to be better from the position of the politicians, I'm always careful about this. But what I can tell you about my approach uh, to the United States in my capacity as president of Poland, I believe as follows. Euro-Atlantic bond. This is an absolutely fundamental thing. History has taught Europe and the United States, not only Europe, but also the United States has drawn the lesson. And I always uh, stress it because I also communicated it to uh, consecutive presidents of the United States. I have already cooperated with three US presidents, with Barack Obama, with President Trump, and today with President Joe Biden. And I always stress in my conversations, this is a relationship which is, which pays off both ways. If there is a war in Europe, uh, the United States, if there is a big war in Europe, the United States, and that was demonstrated in the First World War, in the Second World War, the U.S. has to come and fix uh, the thing, support Europe, so that Europe regains its peace. Uh, people die in Europe and people, uh, U.S. soldiers die. So this is uh, not good for anyone. So the best thing is to keep cooperation all the time to prevent war so that we're able to strike the balance, the security balance, which is so badly needed. It is absolutely clear to me. So strengthening the Euro-Atlantic bond is the fundamental thing. And here, I believe that we should be working on it. And no matter who the president of the US is, 
the United States should be working on this no matter who governs in Europe. And Europe should be working on it no matter who is in power in the United States. That is my personal opinion. Now, speaking about Polish interests, I think it is the duty of the president of Poland always to have as good relations as possible with the United States. And it doesn't really matter from which political party a U.S. president comes, whether he is a, or she is a Republican or a Democrat, or maybe uh, there is some other political group in power in the future. It is the interest which is nonpartisan. Uh, if you look at American internal policy or if you look at any kind of ideas. The most important thing is security, strengthening your Atlantic community, and this is the rudimentary, the basic task. That is why I'm observing the U.S. elections very calmly. I would like these elections to, to run in a very calm and peaceful way. Of course, I'm most worried and concerned about such developments as um, the unrest which we were able to see after the last U.S. elections. That is a situation where we can see that potentially a stability in the United States can be upset. So this is uh, something that we can consider dangerous. But if we are seeing a normal democratic process of yet another election, of course we will have to welcome any election that is made. That is true. We, as European presidents, we who do not vote for a U.S. president, we have to accept any choice made by the U.S. people. We have to accept every choice, and we have to try and cooperate in the best possible way. Well, of course, also demonstrating on our side the will to cooperate, but uh, cooperation on the basis of mutual interests. Uh, so uh, both uh, parties have to be the winners. It has to be a win-win situation. That is why uh, in the run-up to the Polish presidency of the European Union in 2025, uh, in early 2025, Poland will take over the presidency of the uh, European Council. Uh, among our priorities, which we have adopted and which we want to realize, uh, during our presidency for us and for the whole European Union, we decided that our priority will be the strengthening of the Euro-Atlantic unity. So what we are saying is more Europe in the United States, more United States of America in a united Europe, uh, more common interests, more common economic relations, and also uh, more common relations in terms of security in the area of security. Other priorities that we have on our list is to admit new member states, including Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkan states. And another priority is energy security of Europe, because we believe this issue is the most important. But the first priority is security, security, and more security, both economic one as well as military security. And the key here is the Euro-Atlantic bond. And in terms of economy, as far as I'm concerned, this was demonstrated by COVID pandemic, when the supply chains from Asia, from uh, China were broken, when there were problems. Uh, the Euro-Atlantic uh, bond indeed demonstrated how key it was. And I have no doubt whatsoever that we have to boost it this is number one. And number two, we have to build our European potential uh, in terms of economy. But as far as security is concerned, then the Euro-Atlantic bond is absolutely of fundamental importance. Uh, you're a diplomat, so I expect a <laughs> diplomatic answer, but I can, I will ask anyway. Are you calm? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Say more. <laughs> Listen, we've learned, we Ukrainians, we've learned how to survive and prevail in any reality. Uh, whatever the choice the people of America will make, we will work with that reality, and we will be finding solutions that benefit our country, but also transatlantic security and global security as a whole. Frankly, I'm more concerned with what will happen on day one and further on after elections, because it really matters that the United States political system remains focused, that America will not drown into domestic fights, um, uh, spending resources, political resources, on fixing uh, entirely uh, inter-party uh, <coughs> discussions and issues, because America is important for global stability and America will have to remain focused on global issues, and Ukraine is one of those global issues. So um, when it comes to names, 
I mean, we we have experience. We President Zelensky um, had this short short period of uh, interaction with President Trump while he was still in office, and um, you know there were diff different moments. But we should all remember that it was actually President Trump who sold us the first lethal weapons, the javelins. It was not the Obama administration. Um, he his Trump's administration issued the Crimea Declaration, turning. Uh, policy into irreversible policy, the policy of non-recognition of the illegal annexation. The first patrol boats, uh, Mark uh, Six and Islanders, this program was uh, cleared by the Trump administration. We started <coughs> receiving them to reinforce our, na our Navy. So um, we have to respect the choice of the people of America. We will remain very realistic, very focused. And uh, we will be finding solutions because there is just no other way <laughs> for us but to find these solutions. Let me bring the audience in. If there is a question, I see, I see a hand there. Uh, it's a question for Minister uh, Kuleba. Um, the counter-offensive didn't really work very well. Uh, so uh, my question for you is, uh, do you expect to be facing questions, not so much from international supporters, but from Ukrainian society as to what is the path to victory and how you would define victory in 2024? You know, the, the landing of Allied forces in Normandy in 1944 did not end very well immediately, right? And the Ardennes counteroffensive of the Nazi Germany was pretty successful. And no one was asking these kind of questions back then because everyone realized that uh, there, there was an evil that allies were fighting against, that war consists of different battles, and if we remain focused on uh, uh, the struggles and battles which were not as successful as expected, then we will, of course, help to proliferate uh, defeatist voices, and we will reinforce the Russian message, because it's the Russian message, the Russian narrative is out there that you see you cannot beat us on the ground. But I made my, my, I made my point earlier before. We defeated them on the ground in 2022. We defeated them on the sea in 2023. And we are completely focused on defeating them in the air in 2024. So let's focus on winning the war and not on finding arguments, which I find artificial with all respect, on why we cannot win the war. Excuse me, can I uh, join to that as well with, uh, with just some reference? Uh, uh, because uh, I think it is important that we also study the experience of uh, uh, the First and Second World War, uh, of course, but, uh, uh, but uh, we have to avoid to find ourselves in a Third World War. So that is just something that I would like uh, to, to, uh, to emphasize, that uh, actually NATO is uh, not at war and the European Union is not at war for now. And I think what we have to avoid is that uh, militarily uh, also getting involved and and also avoid the escalation of the war. So we have to support Ukraine in its uh, fight, uh, in its protection of uh, its homeland. But I think what is so precious for us, I'm also a mother of three children, that we live still in a peaceful country. And uh, we have to s keep our uh, country safe. I, I think we have to keep all our countries safe and try to do our utmost in order to, to avoid the escalation of the war. It, of course, in the meantime, means that we uh, keep further supporting uh, Ukraine in its fight. I go back to my to my earlier question then do you think that ukrainian victory is important for the protection of the rest of europe and i keep i, I come back to my previous answer when i say that uh, we have to make it clear that aggression is not a way uh, aggression uh, it won't work that and that is why i say that uh, so russia like shouldn't win this than war than I, 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 that's why I'm saying that Russia should not win this war and cannot win this war. And I think that w that is what we have to keep in mind. And we have to can, support... You can have a frozen conflict and you can say that Russia hasn't won this war, but a frozen conflict would be... Yes, you can have a frozen very conflict. Bad news and I, don't th I don't think that this uh, remaining uh, five minutes uh, yes, uh, enable us to, to, to find a Another solution to the war. But I think what we what actually Ukraine is working on is, uh, is the peace formula. So Ukraine has put on the table the peace formula. Hungary has also joined all of our 
our countries actually are there at the table. That's what we are working on because our ultimate goal should be at the end of the day peace. We should uh, keep that in mind. The question is for now how we can get to that, but we shouldn't forget that. And I don't think we, we can solve this in, in five mi remaining minutes. Let's try anyway. Who else has a question? <laughs> yes, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, you've mentioned the, the United States a lot during this, but, but no one's mentioned the other global superpower. What's the role of China during 2024 to solve this crisis? Who'd like to take his... Well, I think, first of all, when it comes to, to the United States, since you said you wanted all of us to comment, I think Europe needs the United States involved, uh, attached to the values and principles that are basically freedom and democracy and peace. And that's why I think whatever happens in the elections in November, we have to strive for an engaged United States regarding the assistance to Ukraine. I'm not saying it's... Uh, an immediate effect on the level of support to the European Union, but any change will politically have some sort of repercussions. This is how the world works. That's why I think we need this commitment. But at the same time, European Union should really strengthen its defense capabilities. And this is, I think, a development that all of us have understood and all of us are clearly engaged. My country, which is one of the smaller countries, has increased its budget over the last seven years in terms of defense spe spending more than 100%, just to give you an idea. And the capabilities, whether it's uh, in our Air Force or our uh, land forces or our um, Marine, it's being something that is a part of the normal and well understood and, in the societal terms, accepted investments. When it comes to China, uh, I think our key element is that China remains out of the conflict when it comes to uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, and, it be, and it re, that it remains an interlocutor of the West in striving for peace. This, I think, should be our main, main objective. And I think, especially in the context of the attempt of a new world order with the BRICS, with different poles, uh, creating a globe that has a, a rather different uh, structure and shape than it had, uh, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And one final point. Current Russia's aggression against Ukraine, it's not only two years. This is the second phase of the process that started 10 years ago. And, and I think we should understand it in a such a way. It's a, it's a well-planned uh, situation where the state of play in terms of current situation in the field is that we have two more Ukrainian regions being temporarily occupied. This is where we are. I want Svetlana to, um, to come in on, on China in, in particular. Do you have any contact with, um, with China? Do, they, do you discuss Belarus with them? No, actually we as democratic forces uh, don't have communication with China because at the moment they are somehow uh, supporting uh, Belarusian regime, though uh, uh, you know the Chinese they are very uh, pragmatic and they stopped many uh, much cooperation with the Belarus, but nevertheless. But we see that uh, dictators, you know, tyrannies in the world, they are making coalitions and it's a huge threat to the democratic world. And you know, when sometimes I hear that, uh, uh, you know, we shouldn't be involved in this war in Ukraine, you know, we have to keep uh, our country safe, uh, it's propagandistic narrative, uh, Russian narrative, that it's not your war, it's Ukrainian's war. Let them, uh, you know, fight this issue themselves. But uh, I suppose that one day, if we let things to be like this, uh, uh, the enemy tyranny will knock your doors and uh, what you are going to do. You know, many years of appeasements and uh, attempts of re-educate dictators, they haven't worked. You know, and half measures only harm the situation because I see now, uh, you know, some countries, on the one hand, they are condemning the war. On the other hand, they are continuing to trade with uh, Russia. They are creating loopholes for uh, trade with Russia. So it, it's, it, it, it should be stopped. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I will ask. I would like to ask about um, European uh, defense and maybe um, President Duda. It, do you need champions? Do you need companies to actually merge and create 
European champions, because one of the problems that we've seen, and not just in, um, in Ukraine, is the lack, the shortages in uh, munitions in particular, but not only munitions. How do you resolve that long term? We know that you know we are living in a much more complicated world. War is is back. Um, what do you think? The, this is a very serious problem, and I would say even a shameful problem. Suddenly, it turned out. Uh, suddenly, it turned out that in our European uh, storages, we do not have um, enough reserves uh, uh, to uh, even defend Europe if there was a serious aggression. I have no doubt whatsoever that we should tighten cooperation within the European Union inside Europe speaking about the production of ammunition and also uh, in terms of developing new armaments. Also, I believe that uh, European cooperation in construction of, for instance, a European tank or in developing European aviation at the EU level absolutely should be tightened. And joint projects, from my perspective, are very much welcome. The production of ammunition, indeed, is um, an element which is much telling. As a matter of fact, uh, there are still shortages of ammunition. Of course, uh, there is a problem what standards we are sticking to, the NATO standard ammunition and the uh, post-Soviet standard ammunition. At least in the beginning of the war, Ukrainian was using that standard. Um, the majority of such ammunition was used. Um, so if we look at the reserves of ammunition, they're running out, they're being depleted, uh, the older type of ammunition. We almost don't have it anymore, but still we are um, having a shortage of NATO standard ammunition. And looking at, uh, unfortunately, the deteriorating security situation in Europe, and looking at the threats which we're discussing here today. On the one hand, there is a threat with Russian imperialism. Unfortunately, I believe it is still growing all the time. On the other hand, uh, we have mentioned China in our discussion, and we hear that we do not know what the outcome of the presidential election will be in Taiwan, uh, which happened a couple of days ago, what kind of situation would be there. We were, we're discussing that. Uh, all of that demonstrates that um, being ready and maintaining readiness to respond uh, should there be any kind of aggressive behavior, not only towards us directly, but also wherever we are helping, the preparedness for that and our preparation to do that today is indispensable. So absolutely, economic cooperation, industrial cooperation in this respect at the EU level, it is something that we should be doing, absolutely. Well, we, as President Novak said, um, we have not solved the Ukraine uh, question, but I hope that we have been able to contribute a little bit to uh, the debate. Thank you all for, for being here. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much.